My name is John Passfield, and I'm going to read from my novel, uh, John Passfield, Saturday Morning, in a moment. This will be called Saturday Morning Video 2, uh, The Cougar and the Mountain. So here's the cover of the novel, John Passfield, Saturday Morning, a photo, and then a novel by John Passfield. My name is on twice, because the first name is the main character, who happens to be myself at 21 years old, John Passfield. And the second name, of course, is the writer, me, John Passfield, a little older. I'm 76 years old. As I sit here, a couple of years ago, I wrote this novel. The photo is of uh, my about-to-be wife in the summer of 1967 when the photo is taken, and myself. She's still my wife in the year 2021, quite a few years later. Uh, the automobile, the car is a 1960 Austin Healey Sprite. Yeah, beautiful little car, but I had some problems with it. And uh, there's some stories of how that car became a rather dangerous car in the novel, but I won't read them uh, today. I'm going to isolate one story today. In this reading, I'm going to read just one story from the many stories in the novel. It's a story that I will call The Cougar and the Mountain, though that title does not appear in the novel. It's a story which happened to me when I was 19 years old two summers before the events of the novel. I wrote the story in 16 segments, one per chapter for each of the 16 chapters of the novel. So the main story is of myself at 21 years old with a crew, two other guys, and a garbage truck, and we're collecting garbage on the streets of my hometown, St. Thomas. But floating through the mind, layering in the mind of myself, the main character at 21, is a story that happened earlier of the cougar in the mountain. And there's 16 chapters of action in the novel, therefore 16 chapters of thought. About 50 images per chapter, but only one image is the image of the cougar and the mountain. But it's there for a reason, and it's an image arc. It uh, lasts through the 16 chapters. It has something to suggest, this image arc. And the reader of the novel can ask, what that might be. What is the meaning of this as it applies to this person, myself, at 21 years old and on into the potential future? So it does not have a narrator who tells the reader what the story of a previous event is doing in a novel of present events. It starts, <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter one. So let's go to chapter one, page six, for the first segment. My day off at Chateau Lake Louise. Now the story does explain itself, but I'll just say this before I start. Chateau Lake Louise is a hotel in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and I worked there in the summer of 1965 when I was 19 years old. So there's also Lake Louise Station, which is a railway station further down the mountain from Chateau Lake Louise. And then there's Banff, beautiful little town in the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. So those three figure in the story. So it's my day off at Shadow Lake Louise. The other gardeners can do without me for a day. I'm going to hitchhike down to Banff and take the bus back. That way, I won't have to worry about getting back on time. Breakfast with the guys before I light out on my own. Now I'll just glance down for page numbers once in a while. Page 15 is uh, the next installment. So I'm leaving about 50 images out here when I, uh, I go from chapter to chapter. 50 images about uh, what the person's doing, uh, collecting garbage, but also uh, what might be the significance of his life so far and his projected life into the future. I'll hitchhike down to Banff, save my money, see the sights and walk around all day, take the bus back up to Lake Louise Station, get the hotel limo from there, for the ride up the road to the chateau. All the makings of a really excellent day. Then we go to page 24. For another installment of this image arc. Lake Louise Station closes down at 9 o'clock. The last limo leaves at 9 p.m. Be sure to be there by 9 o'clock. There's a cougar in the area. If you get there late, you'll be looking for a meal. So a little warning there for the end of the day when I'm coming back. 
Then we go to page 33. Hitchhiking down to Banff. So happy to get a ride. Nice of the heating guy to stop and pick me up. Enjoying the mountains on either side as we ride and chat. Them cougars don't take no prisoners, I'll tell you that. So another little warning uh, for when I come back, that there's a cougar in the area. Then page 42, again skipping about uh, 10 pages of imagery. Gotta be back at the boilers by this afternoon. Too bad or I would have given you a ride back from Banff. If you hitchhike, you won't have to pay for a bus. Enjoy your day in Banff. There's a lot to see in a day. The shift I'm on starts sharp at 4 o'clock. Then page 51. Skipping another chapter of imagery. I wander around Banff, a beautiful little town, nestled in the mountains, a tourist town, but completely unspoiled. Hey, what am I thinking? I'm a tourist too. So sometimes you think you're exempt from some of the things in life. And when you think about it, well, no, you're not exempt. Eh? You're just as human as everybody else. And anything that happens to humans can happen to you too. So let's go to page 60 then. Spending a wonderful day in Banff, right in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, the Cave and Basin, the Hot Springs, Sulphur Mountain, the Banff Springs Hotel, Banff Indian Days. I sit on the bleachers right up at the fence. Plenty to see and do in the town of Banff. So Indian Days uh, then and perhaps still now. A rodeo, but on a smaller scale. And you sit in bleachers right up at the fence watching a rodeo. Just marvelous. So that was page 60. Let's go to page 69. Again, nine pages of imagery that we're leaving out of this reading. All impinging. Imagery illuminates other imagery. Uh, it works uh, in unison, but we're leaving that out just for this reading. I take the bus back to Lake Louise Station. That's the railway station. I get there at 8 o'clock. Only one other person on the bus, but he stays on. Only a tiny dim light on the platform. The door to Lake Louise Station is tightly locked. Hmm, a little glitch in the program here. 105. Um, I think. No. 78. Sorry, my mistake. Jumping ahead here. Page 78 is the next installment. Sorry about that. No hotel limo at Lake Louise Station. No limousine arrives at 9 o'clock. I wait on the station platform until 9.30. And then, quarter to 10. It's a pretty dark world out there. I decide that I'm going to have to walk. So, Lake Louise Station is a railway station. Chateau Lake Louise is up the mountain by road. Dark out in the mountains means there's no, uh, what, secondary or peripheral light. There's no street lights. There's no uh, gas station lights to light your way. It's totally dark. No sun. No sun, obviously, at night, but no moon, no stars. Totally black. That was page uh, 78 here. We'll go to 87. Try not to get mixed up in the page numbers when I just pick things out. Not a sliver of a moonbeam. No lights along the road. The night is completely black. I can't see the road beneath my shoes. I put my left foot on the gravel and my right foot on the pavement as I walk. So being from Ontario, I don't think I'd ever seen darkness that was that dark, as dark as it was in the mountains. So if you can't see your feet, your shoes and you're walking along a paved road, and you don't want to walk all the way to British Columbia, you're going to have to catch the side road, which is leaving from your left and going up the mountain. So I put my right foot on the pavement and my left foot on the gravel. And then, as you'll see in the next segment, I believe, when both feet hit pavement, you know you've hit the secondary road that's moving off to the left. But boy, pitch black. 
87 and then uh, 96. The sweat is pouring off me. My feet are getting tired. It's all uphill. A noise somewhere in the distance. Was that the sound of a cougar growl? Can a cougar smell human flesh from miles away? And then we go to, from 96, we go to 105. I walk with one foot on the gravel and one foot on the pavement. I hear noises, all kinds of noises. The whole mountain seems alive. There's a cougar in the area. I was told not to walk alone. I'm covered in sweat as I walk and walk and walk. And then to 115. Both of my feet are walking on pavement. I stop and inch myself back in the dark. I turn left and start to walk up the Lake Louise Road. The climb is getting steeper and I'm soaking in gallons of sweat. The night is so dark that I can't even read my watch. Every once in a while, I hear a low cougar growl. And then uh, 123. Finally, a light in the distance. Past Deer Lodge and onto Chateau Lake Louise. I climb the hill to the staff cabin and open the gardener's door. The other three gardeners are asleep, and I'm out of breath, and my clothes are heavy with sweat. And then uh, 133, again, leaving out 10 pages of uh, imagery that illuminate this story and are illuminated by this story. I peel off my sweat-soaked clothes, and I run a cold bath. I lie there a long, long time trying to cool off. The sweat is still pouring off me as I lie here in the tub. I towel off and get on my pajamas and slip into bed. My heart is still thumping as I wait to fall asleep. And then the last installment, page 140. My nerves are on high alert. I don't think I can calm down. My sweat is clammy as I lie here on the bed. I'm sure I heard that cougar growl a couple of times. I'll just lie here and try to think of something else. Well, the worst things that have happened to us, and the worst things that could possibly happen, even if they don't happen, but are possibilities, uh, we try not to think about. And yet, really, to negotiate our way through life, it's important that we do think about some of the worst things that have happened as prototypes, I guess, patterns of potential future worst things so we can avoid them. Eh? So here's a note that I, uh, that's a little awkward picking out the page numbers, but uh, when you're reading, of course, everything flows. Here's a note that I wrote as I was reading those passages over. It's true that everyone has a book in them. The reason is that everyone has stories that have happened to them or that they have caused to happen. But alone, a story is just a story. It tells us that something is happening or has happened or might happen, but it offers no more. It's merely a collection of information. However, if one selects the stories from one's past and creates a pattern of stories, the stories become more than information. The events of the cougar in the mountain happened to me. On its own, it would simply be a story of information. But when embedded in the larger story of my life at 21 years old, looking back and trying to look ahead, the story of the cougar in the mountain becomes a story of questions. If the elements of this story are going to be typical of the future events of my life, then what are the elements that are either going to please me or plague me 
as my future life goes on. And that is the definition of imagery. Imagery is information that asks, demands, pleads to be interpreted in light of other information. So if I say the man walked briskly from the bank, that's just information. You might say, well, what color was his shirt? But that would be information. On its own, it's just an information story. But if I say the man walked briskly from the bank and then I say the alarm bell of the bank began to ring, that's a piece of information too. But together, there are questions. The first question is, what's the connection between the man walking briskly away from the bank and the alarm bell of the bank beginning to ring? So a piece of information on its own is just information. Story on its own is just information. Two stories together, connections, questions, they become imagery. So the cougar in the mountain story is analogous imagery in my novel. There are many more stories in the novel which act as analogous imagery because there are many possibilities of a future life in the story of a person of 21 going on 22 with his whole life ahead of him. The stories are all arranged in patterns, image patterns, which invite speculative thought, questions about the life of the main character, me in this case, questions about the life of the reader, past and potential future. And that is exactly what a novel should do. So stories about my life uh, can illuminate my present and future life. Stories in a novel can illuminate a reader's present and potential future life if they think about it, if they let those stories raise questions. Okay, so the novel, once again, is John Passfield Saturday Morning. It's on Amazon. You can look it up there. There's more information. My publisher's website is rocksmillspress.com. There's more information there, R-O-C-K-S-M-I-L-L-S-P-R-E-S-S.com, all one word. More information at uh, rocksmillspress.com. My website has more information in the form of two books, free books. You can access them. One is uh, planning Saturday morning. Uh, simply uh, the idea of the book, uh, an assessment of all the stories I could could have used in the book, and and then the arranging of the story. So it's basically how how I wrote the novel, how a novel gets written. That's free if you just go to my website johnpassfield.ca and click on the planning Saturday morning icon. Then, as I was uh, polishing the complete rough draft, I wrote a journal. These are just notes on. Uh, what I've accomplished in writing the novel, what I would like to do in future novel writing, and that's free uh, of access. If you just go to johnpassville.ca and click on the Saturday morning journal uh, icon. And lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.